could all please stand out of respect for the word. I'd like to read from Exodus chapter 34, verses 27 to 30. Exodus chapter 34, beginning with verse 27. Then the Lord said to Moses, write these words, for according to the tenor of these words, I have made a covenant with you and with Israel. So he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He neither ate bread nor drank water. And he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now it was so, when Moses came down from Mount Sinai, and the two tablets of the testimony were in Moses' hand when he came down from the mountain, that Moses did not know that the skin of his face shone while he talked with him. So when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come near to him. And then if you could also flip, please, to Matthew chapter 5 with verse 14. Matthew chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. So let your light shine before men, that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. You may be seated. The message that God has put on my heart for tonight, I titled, God's Suntan, mainly so that we can remember it, and also because summer is coming up, and we all like to be tan. And this idea, this imagery came to my mind when several years ago, I used to frequent this one pool near my house, and there was a gentleman that would go there every single day. He was retired, he had nothing else to do, he had paid his fee, so he'd go to this pool every day, and he sat in the same corner every single time. And my siblings know him, His name was John, because we laughed at him, because every time he'd get up out of the water, since he sat in this corner, the edge of the water had put a terrible uh, tan line on his body. So he was very tan from his chest up, but all the way down to his legs, he was a pasty, pasty white. And it was really, really sad to see that had he spent so much time in the sun, if he had just put his full body there, he would have been a very nice tan. But what I realized from this, and what I want us to sort of get on the idea of thinking tonight, is that if you sit in the sun for a long amount of time, first you'll get burned, but eventually you'll get tan. It's very obvious when you spend time in the sun. You can put sunscreen, you can do whatever you'd like, but eventually that sun is gonna kiss your face, it's gonna kiss your body, and it's going to be clear that you were spending time outside. And so when Moses came down from the mountain, he had spent 40 days and 40 nights with God. It says even that he had seen the back of God. When he came down from the mountain, it was very clear and it was very obvious that he had been with God. Not just emotionally, not just spiritually, but physically on his face, it shone to the point that all of Israel was scared of him. And so I have several key takeaways for tonight that I want us to focus on. And it's that God's presence in our life is obvious. If we have him, it's obvious. If we don't, it's just as obvious. And the second thing is that we reflect the light of God as Christians. So this first idea, I don't want to spend too much time, but God's presence is obvious. Not just when we spend time in worship and in prayer, but here's here's a very good example. If you can flip with me, please, to Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to go over several verses quickly. It's talking about the three youth, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as they're coming before Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel chapter 3 with verse 15. It says, Now if you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I have made, good. But if you do not, do not worship, you will be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God that will deliver you from my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if you do not let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, 
nor will we worship the gold image which you have set up. And then from verse 23, and these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell down bound into the midst of the burning fiery furnace. Then the king Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and he spoke, saying to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and they said, true, O king. And he says, look, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, but the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Amen. I'm going to pose a very simple question to you tonight, and is how did King Nebuchadnezzar, a pagan who did not believe in God, how did he know what a Son of God would look like? Because you can't make the argument that this fourth man in the fire was just handsome, though that would be a phenomenal compliment that you could give someone, telling them that they look like a son of God. There was something unique, there was something different, there was something to be held about this fourth man in the fire. And we like to say that it's a Christophany, an appearance of Christ in the Old Testament, or it can be said that it's an angel. But the main point to take away from this is that when God is present, it is obvious, praise God. When God is in our lives, even those who do not know him will recognize his hand. Notice that it wasn't Israelites who said, look, it's like an angel, like a son of God, who they were well aware and well affiliated with the presence of God. It was a pagan who could recognize this. And why does this matter? Why am I going over this? It's because I want us to realize tonight that even the people in the world, even the people that we interact with every single day, they will be able to recognize God's presence in our life and they will equally be able to recognize if we do not have it. It's a very dangerous thing to hear from someone, oh, I didn't take you to be the religious type. Or to hear from someone, oh, I didn't know that you were a Christian. They should know. There should be something there, and that something should be the presence of God that will be undeniable. That even the pagans, even those in the world, will recognize his heavenly presence. Something that Brother Phil spoke about several weeks ago is from Matthew chapter 17, verses 1 to 3. This is from the Transfiguration on the Mount. And we know very well that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and He is God. And He said this explicitly in Scripture. But when He transfigured, it says in verse 1, After six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John and His brother, led them high up on a mountain by themselves, and He was transfigured before them. His face, it shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with him. When Jesus appeared in the form of God, clearly, there was a difference. And there was a physical difference. Even though Jesus was already God, when God is present in our lives, it is obvious and so why am I telling you all these things? Yes, you're probably saying, Joel, yes, obviously, if God appeared to us in form, if he appeared to us physically, it would be phenomenal, it would be bright, it would be an ethereal experience. We know this, and it's obvious. But the reason I'm telling you this is back to the point that I started with, is that if we spend time in the sun, it will be obvious. I'm posing this analogy for myself, and I'm posing it for you as well, is what does our spiritual skin look like? Are we tan? Do we have a rich, a vitamin D rich skin that's it's a soft brown and it's sun kissed where people can tell you've been to the beach, you've spent time in God's presence? Can that be said about our spiritual skin? Or is it the opposite? Is it the white that comes with winter when we haven't seen the sun for a long time? What does our spiritual skin look like? In fifth grade, in our science class, our teacher bought 20 lizards and she put them in, a, in an aquarium and we were there and this was a really messed up experience, uh, experiment, but we were trying to see how long we could get these lizards to survive. And we gave them everything we needed. We gave them light, we gave them food, we gave them water. Um, but what was very, very interesting is when you put 20 lizards in an aquarium, they get very stressed out not only because you have a classroom of fifth graders making noise all day, not just because they're crowded, but because they're not in their regular environment. And what's very interesting about these lizards is you can measure how stressed they are. 
You can't do that in humans. You know, if, you, if I ask you how stressed are you on a scale of one to 10, some people will say 10, some people may say five, even if they're going through the same circumstance. But in lizards, you can measure exactly how stressed they are, and I'll tell you why. It's because they are green, naturally, they're about this big. They're green from, head, not head to toe, head to tail. They're green, but they get these little gray splotches when they're stressed. And the lizards that are very stressed get very gray, and the lizards that are only a little bit stressed have no gray on them. And the ones that aren't stressed are just a healthy green. And it was a strange experience watching these 20 lizards all slowly turn gray and die, one by one. And the reason I'm telling you guys this is because whether you have God's light or whether you have stress in your life, it's obvious, it's clear. You know, we can, you can try to paint that lizard green, for example it would still be stressed inside. You can try to hide your problems with a smile, but the problems are still inside. You can come to church every week. You can try to fake that you have the light of God in you, but only up to a point, and you can't hide what's inside. I'll confess something to you all, and it's that my face is a terrible liar. Oftentimes when I go out with my mom and I'm frustrated or angry about something, she'll tell me, Joel, put on a smile, look bright, look happy, and I can't do it, I can't. Um, it's, it's just a problem that I have, and to an extent, I think that's the truth with all of us. Some people are better than others at hiding this, but the reality is, at one point or another, the truth is going to come out on the state of our soul. And so I'm asking you again, what does your spiritual skin look like? Is it spray tanned? Is it fake? Are we trying to hide God's light in us? The second thing that I want us to take away tonight is that we reflect the light of God. Uh, a great misconception that we have is that we are the ones shining. We are the ones showing our light to the world. And yes, I know that the translation says our light, but the essence, the reason why I put John chapter 8 verse 12, it says, then Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. And the reason I'm telling you these things is because there's nothing that we can do from our human nature that is going to show light to the world. Because we, as humans, are sinners. We are innately evil. We know this from the book of Romans. It says, all have fallen short of the glory of God. All have sinned. And so the light is not coming from us. If we're showing light to the world, it's not from inside ourselves and our human nature. It should be coming from God. And that's why I began with Matthew Chapter 5, verse 14 to 16. 16 says, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Amen. I think that Moses made a mistake in Exodus 34. And on one hand, who am I to say that he made a mistake? This titan of faith who is much, much closer to God than I think any of us will ever get, even I, but he, even though he saw the face of God and his face shone, he came down from the mountain and he put a veil on top of his face. If you continue reading chapter 34, he hid the light that God had shown him. And I personally don't think that this was the right thing to do because yes, though Israel feared him, this could be a sign to the world of God's presence in him. And I want this to be a call for us as for us to not put a veil on top of our faces. We come here every week, in the morning and in the evening on Sunday, and we are presented before the most beautiful light, the most beautiful presence that is not offered in any other place except the church of God. We should be ashamed to go out into the world and try to hide it. This is an analogy I've used before, but I'm going to use it again because it's very relevant and it's very important. We like to say that we have Jesus in our heart, and this is very good. But what does your heart do? Your heart pumps blood, right? It pumps blood from your toe to your fingers. Every extremity of your body is being powered by blood, which brings oxygen there. If I cut my finger, blood is going to come out. If I cut my leg, blood is going to come out. And every single cell of blood at some point has passed through my heart. So if I have Jesus in my heart, I should see Jesus in my fingers. I should see Jesus in my toes. I should see Jesus in the crown of my head. In every extremity of my life, I should see Christ. 
If we truly have Christ in our life, if we truly have the light of God in our life, which is Jesus Christ, it should be very clear and it should be very, very obvious. And I'm asking myself and I'm asking you again, what does our spiritual skin look like? And why do I think that it's so important to say this? Why, why is it so important to show our light to others? It says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, first it tells us, let your light shine, but it falls with a very, very important second part. It says, why should our light shine before men? Why? That they may see your good works, yes, and that they may glorify your Father in heaven. Letting our light shine is a testimony to those around us. I found something very interesting several weeks ago. We were cleaning upstairs with the youth, and I found this little paper towel. I don't know who can read it, but on the top it says church service. And there were three kids playing, like ages 6 to 10, and they, they were playing church service because there's an amvon up there. They had set chairs in rows, and they were having a church service. They had prayer, introduce visitors, COVID and disinfect, speech, choir song, prayer, anyone can sing, how we have Thursday nights, collecta and prayer. Trei rugăciun, slava Domnului. So, and this was a very beautiful thing. It was very nice to see. And the reason why I keep this with me as a reminder is because when we say, let your light shine, it's shining first to those around us. We like to say, let your, shine, let your light shine to the world. When you go to work, when you go to school. But our light should shine first in the house. My light should shine first to my parents before I let it shine to my schoolmates. And the same thing for parents. The, your light should shine to your children first before you let it shine at work. And it's, it's important to realize for all of us, for the parents and for the youth, and for anyone that has someone younger than them is to realize that this younger generation is looking up to us and they're going to follow in the precedence that we set. They're going to see the light that we shine and they're going to follow along those footsteps. And what precedence are we setting? Do we want the next generation to replicate what they see in us? Are we, if we are reflecting God's light truly, this should not be a concern for us. This should not be a fear. This shouldn't be a problem. Do we want the next generation to worship like us? Do we want the next generation to pray like us? Do we want the next generation to format their services like us? The most important thing for us to realize is that we need to establish a precedence of God's presence and God's mercy for those who will follow us. And I say again, brothers and sisters, that if we have the light of God in our life, this should not be a fear or a concern. The most important thing, and just important that I want us to realize, is that the light that we shine to others is not our own. It's not ours. It's not coming from inside of us. It's coming from God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, For it is God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. God. And he who has shown in our hearts gives the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. If we have the light of God, brothers and sisters, it's because many years ago, Jesus Christ came onto this earth and died for our sins on the cross. If we have the light of God, it's not because I was righteous. It's not because we did something good. It's because there was another who took our sins on his back to die for us. If we have the light of God, it's because where our sin was great, his grace was more, praise God. If we have the light of God, it's because we couldn't pay the iniquity and the debt of our sin, but someone else did, and that was the Son of God, Jesus Christ the Messiah. And praise God because we have the light of God, not because of anything we could have done, but because of his mercy and his love that he showed us. Because the perfect lamb laid down his life in our place. That is why we have the light of God. This is the light of God. Forgiveness and salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ. There would be no light for us to shine if Jesus Christ didn't come down onto this earth. Tonight we're remembering his sacrifice through Cina Domnului. And if you've come here tonight, maybe realizing that perhaps you've gone for too long with an unhealthy spiritual skin. You've gone too long trying to fake the light of God. I pray tonight that we repent, 
Not just because the next generation is watching. Not just because God is watching. Not just because the world is watching. Because a life without light is a life without God. A life without light is a light without God. God's, with a, God, a life without God's light is full of darkness. And the bottom line for all of this is that a life without God is no life at all. And so I pray that tonight we all take a look at our lives. We all take a look at our spiritual skin and we ask ourselves truly, what light are we reflecting, if anything at all? And if the answer to that is not one that we like to see, not one that we're proud of, I pray that we repent and that we come to the arms of a Father who's ready to accept us, regardless of our past, regardless of what we've done. We're coming to the God of love and the God of mercy, the only God whom even King Nebuchadnezzar recognized. So I pray that the light of God shine in all of our lives, that it shine to the next generation, that it shine to the world, but that most importantly, we truly have and we have accepted the mercy and the sacrifice which Christ has showed us and that we can spend this in China tonight. Amen.